Fireside Chat Podcast, Episode 2, Get Sven a Barbershop Quartet, recorded January 29th, 2013. Welcome back to Fireside Chat. It's our second episode, and I'm here with my co-host Lucas and Matt. How are you guys doing tonight? Good. I'm great. I feel like uh, hearing that music, that must be what uh, Brian Johnson feels like when Angus Young starts riffing Thunderstruck in front of 100,000 people. There you go. It gets us pumped up to go. It's like when we hear Beasley yell in the team's name when we're live at the games. Yeah. That always gets me fired up, too. So, guys, we're 10 days into the, into the season. How are you feeling about the Flames so far? Uh, some positives, some negatives, but they seem to be making progress with Hartley's new system. Yeah, I agree. Matt, you've been at uh, the first couple games. You're at the San Jose, the uh, Anaheim, and the Vancouver game. Why don't you tell us a bit about what you saw about the system firsthand? Well, one thing I noticed from last season that changed uh, was that the players themselves, they were closer, the forwards were closer to the defensemen. And that in the defensive zone, they would actually collapse more towards Kipper, which helped to basically get any pucks that were in the danger area right in front of the net out instead of, you know, causing an odd man situation in a in the down low area. So, you know, it did help somewhat. And like in the first couple games Kipper he seemed to be a little bit shaky himself and some of the goals that he let in normally he wouldn't so it made it you know it made the team seem a little worse than they were defensively but on the overall they are playing a lot better defensively than last year and I think that thing with Kipper could just be that he hasn't been on the ice for a while Oh yeah, well even usually in the preseason in years gone by he's always been a little rusty like his catching glove is just a little off or he won't get his arms down quite quick enough not a big deal, it takes him about three or four games and then it's, you know, mid-season form practically so I expect him to be a little bit better going forward Lucas, what are you thinking about what you've seen so far with the new system? Well, it's infinitely more interesting to watch. Uh, There there is a lot more, uh, I guess, attempt to be creative, interesting. Like Hartley said in his his press conference at the beginning of the year when he was announced or hired. Um, But I got to say, after the first, after the Vancouver game, I was thinking we were going to see Iginla traded out of here by the end of February. Th- that's how unimpressive the team looked. But um, the Edmonton game, while it was Edmonton... like The Edmonton game is just proof positive that you can't be reactionary when watching this sport. Well, another thing that uh, changed, of course, in the Edmonton game is getting Yuri Hoodler and Roman Cervinka back, Mm -hmm. which I think was larger due to the fact that it allowed the third line to have two quality players on it instead of just uh, Berchi at the time. And, like, one thing I noticed in the Vancouver game is, like, Ginla's line would have a good shift, then Backlund's line would have a good shift, and then when the third line came out things started slowing down and like something would screw up and the momentum would get lost. And yet in the Edmonton game, once Backlund's line came off the ice and Serenka's came on the ice, that they were able to carry the momentum and then the fourth line would give a good energy shift and then you're right back with the Ginla. And it seemed like the Oilers couldn't actually get anything going past like the two minute mark. So... They felt like more of a complete team, I thought, in that Edmonton game. It felt like we had four lines that were all ready to go and all knew exactly what to do. I've been finding, too, that with this system, it seems like every shift and every line has a different identity. In previous systems, I felt like everyone was just kind of the same and they were just slotting bodies in wherever. But I felt that 
every line now has a different identity and feels a little bit different. And I think that's important to keeping a, a team that's going to throw opponents off balance. It is important that every, like, there's a lot more to like about, especially the forward core, but the biggest thing for me in the Edmonton game was Jay Ballmeister actually playing for once in 250 games as a flame, like a $6.7 million defenseman. And the more, that game really crystallized, not even crystallized, I guess just made, made me realize that this team is literally only going to go as far as Bowmeister allows them to go because I think at this point he is physically probably their best player. He's, he could be their he's probably their he is their best defenseman um, in terms of being able to dominate a game physically. You're not likely going to find another guy outside of Kiprasov than Bowmeister who can do that. Now, this is the first time I've seen him play like that since he's been in Calgary. His game against Edmonton was fantastic. He was involved physically. He was great offensively. He was he made a great uh, feed up the middle to spring stage of all people for a breakaway. Um, thinking offense, and maybe that's coaching, maybe that's, I don't know, him breaking out of his shell, but if we can get that Bowmeister from Edmonton every night, then... Our chances of success, our chances, I'm not on the team, then the Flames' chances of success go up exponentially. Well, um, one thing I noticed, uh, especially with all the defensemen, is that because the forwards are a little bit closer to them, that they have an easier chance at moving up into the play. And like you're seeing guys like Brody and Weidman getting activated all the time and jumping into the play as well. And, like, on the Stempniak goal against Edmonton, like, Bomeister uh, was in from the blue line about 20 feet as he pinched in, and that created a lane so that he could pass it across to Stempniak, where, as with Sutter's system, he would be more stuck at the blue line, and he wouldn't pinch in, so the... F- Offensive creativity and abilities of the defensemen under this system seem to be getting enhanced instead of stymied a bit. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And Lucas, I agree that, you know, the Bow Meister we saw in Edmonton was the one I want to be seeing on this team night in and night out. I thought that's the J Bow that we need here, especially for what we're paying him. And when you look at the schedule, I mean, they've played five games so far. Four, five game, four games so far and one on Thursday against the Avalanche. And to me, that is kind of the preseason. That first month is going to be where these guys are getting their legs back and understanding what it is is um, expected of them and that sort of thing. So I think uh, we'll see J-Bo continue to progress as this season goes on. I mean, one would hope, right? I mean, if you really think about it, the reason he's so important is because they've never had him. You can, he is, the, the J-Bow everyone thought we were getting, if we actually get him, that's as good as any deadline acquisition or free agent signing, because he hasn't existed previously. Um, that element of the Flames has just not been there. Now, I still think the Flames' defense is way too small, undersized, and, you know, prone to getting run roughshod over, but... If you get your number one defenseman playing like a number one, that goes a long way to alleviating some of those shortcomings. And very quickly, and then I'll let Maddie jump in here, um, the preseason for this team has got to be at least as much about getting in shape as it is learning the system, because several of the vets, and I'm thinking specifically of Camilleri in this stage, or in this instance, uh, don't look like they're up to game speed, or at least didn't until Edmonton. Yeah, uh, with Bowmeister, sadly, I used to be a very interested Panthers fan at one point, and I used to watch games with Bowmeister, and one of the things that he used to do, especially on the power play, would he, he would sneak in off the point, and his line mates on the power play unit would notice that he was sneaking in, and they'd feed the puck quickly across to him. And that's how he... Because he doesn't have a really good shot. So, like, he would just sneak in and 
you know, catch the goalie off guard, and that's how he ended up getting so many goals. So, you know, if he, we can have him being activated like that, then you could probably see him getting 8, 10, 12 goals again. So, which that would be good. I didn't know there was such a thing as an interested Panthers fan. That's new to me. Well, I still like them, so, but <laughs> they, they, they stink. Hey, there's four of them. <laughs> So why don't we uh, talk about something that we discussed in the last show, which was the backup goalie position on this team. And we'd all said in our roundtable uh, in the last show that we thought there was no way Hank Carlson lost the job. And it looks like Hank Carlson has lost the job. He's not even with the team anymore. He's now a Blackhawk. And Leland Irving's been given the backup job. What are your thoughts, guys? Lucas, you go first. I was wrong. I'm sorry. I, uh, the, the day after we recorded this show, um, I had a chance to, uh, take in one of the scrimmages and I saw Cam Larry, Iginla, and I believe, I can't remember who else, uh, scored, but all exactly the same high glove, high glove, high glove, you know, and admittedly they, they were running five on threes at the time. So you kind of feel a little bit bad for him, but, um, Irving's biggest flaw in that instance uh, seemed to be his limited ability to get the puck down the ice on like a headman pass on a on a power play. And if that's your backup's biggest weakness, um, bye bye, Carlson. Yeah, what? I will miss your celebration. With uh, the trade, at least we get a 7th round pick from Ottawa, so that should be a mid-7th rounder. And Chicago? Yeah, well, no, it was Ottawa's pick from a prior trade. Uh, but, ah. uh, you know, uh, you never know with draft picks, they can turn out to be really good players even from the 7th round. Uh, as for losing Carlson in the trade, eh... You got two goalies that are more or less the same, so getting rid of one doesn't really hurt one way or the other. I've been an Irving fan for a couple of years now. I've always uh, followed him in the AHL, and I've always thought one day he would be the guy that makes it uh, to the Flames in some capacity, either as a starter or as a backup. So I'm glad to see him here, and I think, like Matt said, we had two backups that were equal in a lot of ways, and I, I have no qualms to see um, Hank go. I'm glad we got something for him, even if it's a seventh-round pick. I'd rather get something than just let him go on waivers or have to buy him out. So I was glad to see that at least we got something back for him. Well, in as much as their, I don't know, their actual results at the NHL might be similar, at least one guy doesn't have a built-in glitch like he's an NHL game. Yeah, actually, you know, it's weird because I've seen you were talking about the the glitches or the, I guess, flaws perhaps in Hank's game. Um, I remember when I watched Irving in the preseason a couple years ago, he seemed to have an issue with getting up after he went down on his knees. It would almost take him an extra step to get up. And I always said, that's the flaw, and that's the reason he hasn't made the NHL. And he seems to have corrected that. So I'm glad to see that the team has rewarded him for working hard on those flaws. (laughs) He's uh, He is definitely better at getting up, but uh, in a couple of practices I've seen him in, he's still, um, it, it's, it's noticeable that he's not necessarily the swiftest guy getting back up on his feet. But on the plus side, he doesn't just automatically get down on his knees. Which is important, too. Mm-hmm. So the, the Edmonton game saw the debut of the checks, as everyone's calling them, the two highly touted check players that the Flames were missing for the first couple games of the year, and that was our two forwards, number 10, Roman Cervenka, and number 24, Yari Hoodler. What are your guys' thoughts now that we're seeing them on the ice, and what did you think of what you saw in Edmonton? I thought that both were extremely impressive, especially for their first game in a new system. With Cervenka, he started off a little slow, but over the course of the game, he got increasingly more comfortable. And one of the little things that happened in that uh, second period on the Stempniak goal is that he actually lifted the stick of Eric Belanger right uh, as the pass was coming across to Bomeister, and then he dove and crashed the net. And... You know, just something simple like that ended up creating a a goal just from nothing, even though he didn't really 
get an assist or anything like that. And that play wouldn't have happened at all had he not lifted that stick. And Hoodler seemed to have his legs going really good. He drew a penalty and he was dangerous all night long. So I'm hoping they keep it up. <laughs> yeah, Hoodler they, and Cervenka both really impressed me. They got better as the game went on every shift they looked like they were more comfortable out there hoodler made a couple beautiful passes that we really haven't seen guys make since uh Husalius was here if i think about it like tanga is a great passer uh Husalius had that sort of uh unexpected je ne sais quoi about him that uh hoodler brings and uh I think if they stay healthy, uh, and once Cervenka especially moves back into center, um, they're, they're going to be very good. Yeah, I agree with you. And I noticed that, like you said, the Genese Quad, there's something different about their game because they're um, from overseas, and there's a different game played there. Every country has a slightly different style of hockey, and I think it was nice to see on this team two guys that have chemistry together, and you can tell there's some chemistry there, but also that are bringing a bit of a different look to this team. Our team's heavily populated by Canadians. We've got Backlund from Sweden, um, but you know, really it's it's all mostly North American boys on this team. Um, Barchi from Switzerland, but it was nice to see a little bit something different, a different style meshing in very well with everybody else. One thing I noticed with Hoodler is that he was using uh, his Detroit training rather well, and he was uh, passing the puck off the boards to players as well. Uh, like I noticed in the first period that he actually, when he was in the zone, he was on the goalie's right hand side, and he passed it across the cr- ice right into the opposite corner and banked it off the corner to one of the Flames players that was covered. So, you know, it, just simple things like that create a different aura of the team and it makes it just that little bit much more difficult to defend against because there are radically different styles of play from each line. So, you know, talent-wise, it seems like the first three lines are all more or less equivalent. Yeah, and I, th- I think that's so important, too, to have three lines that are tough to defend against. In the past, sometimes it's felt like if you could shut down the first line on this team, we were done. And now I think you're going to get a lot of depth. And it also gives us a chance that if somebody gets hurt or has an off night, it lets Hartley and his staff really, I think, change these guys up and have a, a deep top nine. I do think it. Uh, this team is... is not necessarily um it, it's not without its weaknesses in the way it's constructed there uh th- there seems to be on several lines a lack of size or grit um and the only way you can really get that with this roster is by playing certain players like jackman or como above what where they should be um and the, again the, like the first three games had me with a laundry list of things to complain about. Edmonton, the Edmonton game has kind of cleansed the palate a bit, but every every so often I have to remind myself it was just Edmonton. As much as we want to, as much as the TSN panel wants to anoint them, uh, they still can't beat us. So, um, th- there's, you know, there's a lot to like about the lines, but I, I do think that if, it- it's a very tenuous uh, sort of uh, success that they had uh, in Edmonton. Like uh, that was a stupid thing to say. Um, what I mean by that is, if anyone goes down for any length of time, I do think that's gonna cause way more problems than we expect it to. Yeah, I think you're right, but you know, I think the Edmonton victory was a good stepping stone, and everybody needs that at some point to have that win to build off. And if somebody does get hurt, I have no doubt that Feaster and Hartley can figure something out. If it's you know, if it's really long term, there's some UFAs that are available. If it's short term, we've got Horak in the minors now. We got guys we can call up. I think those holes can be filled at least for this short season. Probably, you're right. I mean, I, it's difficult to get optimistic 
uh, about the team, even though it's great to have hockey back, just because they've got a habit of heartbreaking. So, I don't know, I, I, I'm probably going to be very measured for the rest of the year, not letting things get too out of control. So for you, Lucas, they really have to kind of win back your trust. And you're saying you're a Flames fan, but you are you don't want to put too much invested into this team. You don't want to invest too much into them until they can prove something to you. Well, I don't want to convince myself that they're better than they are. Um, I'll, I've watched every game thus far. I'll, I will probably continue to watch every game. But it is more of a an intellectual exercise at this point than... Uh, something that I'm going to allow myself to truly get emotionally invested in. I can understand that, and I think, you know, I mean, let's be, let's face it, the Flames have missed the playoffs for three years, and as much as every year we want to say, this year we're going to do it, this year we're going to do it, the fact is this roster hasn't got it done in the past, and I think, yeah, you have to be cautious, and they, these guys have to go one game at a time and prove to us they can actually do it, because every year management says, we we got the roster to make it to the playoffs, and every year we fall a couple points short, so yeah, I see where you're coming from. Well, one of the Flames' problems, though, in the past is that when they they face adversity, they end up trying too hard, and that causes their game just to completely screw up, to the point where like even a five foot pass becomes an adventure. So, and one thing I've noticed thus far this year is they were. <sighs> especially in the later two games, they were more res resorting back to the system and trying to get back to it instead of completely falling apart. Like that first goal by Edmonton last game, uh, if it was last season, because it was the last minute of the sec or first period, you would have likely seen Edmonton come back in the second period and end up scoring two or three goals and then the Flames lose. But this time they actually came out, they reset the clock and they just kept pushing Edmonton and eventually won. So it seems to be more in their head versus anything else because the skill has always been there. It just seems that they beat themselves up. I, uh, I agree with you that this team's success is ultimately going to be determined by its mental strength. Uh, I just, um, I'm not convinced they have necess have the mental makeup to get it done yet. Again, like, like we've said, talent is, or it should be there, it could be there, they are NHL players. Um, again, but what separates the men from the boys is the mental game. And if a couple things happen, you get contributions from the right people. If you create an environment where Jerome McGinley doesn't feel burnt out leading this team into another ninth place, 14th overall pick, then some good stuff can start to happen. But that's something that they've got to break out of and they've got to convince themselves that they can handle more success or that they're capable of it. And no one's going to do that except them. So... And I think based on what you both said, I mean, Lucas, I think part of convincing yourself that you're having success um, starts right from the fact that they've got a brand new staff behind the bench who I think they probably feel, based on what I can tell, um, they feel has more faith in this team. And that's always going to help you. And based on what Matt was saying earlier, I, I've so far seen, and I mean, it's still early, early in the season. But from what I've seen, it seems like these guys, as you said, it's not in their head as much. They seem to be able to bounce back when they're behind, and they're not letting that get to them and really change the whole pace of a game so far, which is really nice to see. In the past, if they were down or made a bad play, sometimes it would just tank the whole team mentally. So, Lucas, last show, you were the guy that really advocated for the defenseman. Is there anything you want to talk about with the defense I'm so far loving the uh, defense pairings of uh, Geo Bowmeister, Weidman, Brody, Sarich, and Smith. Um, which means, of course, Chris Butler is in the press box. And I would like to think that there's more reasons to dislike him than just his pointy head. But it, it just... He... he has seemed overmatched in most situations I've watched him in. 
Um, and and now that Detroit only has three NHL defensemen healthy, Butler to Detroit for a fifth. How about that? I'd want to keep Butler around myself because I think we're going to need him later on if somebody does get hurt. I mean, Sarich is coming off a long-term injury. Who knows how reliable he's going to be this year? Eh, I would... Uh... I would almost rather... If Sarich got hurt, I don't think you replace him with Butler. I think you replace him with Breen. Um, Ser- even on the third pairing, like Butler and, and Smith is fine, It, but then your defense loses almost all of its physical tenacity. Um, and I don't think you're going to have much success in that regard. Like... Butler is a fine defenseman if there are players to contrast his style around him. The problem is, with the Flames, for my money, is that we've got too many guys who play more or less the same softer, more evasive, puck-moving type of style. And there needs to be a little bit more balance. Yeah, I can see that. Overall, um, who who do you is really the standout of the defenseman, Lucas? Brody. I mean, I, th- I think I said in the in the pilot episode that Brody top four fairly soon. I didn't expect it to be three games in, but um, TJ Brody playing with Dennis Weidman is has has thus far been an excellent pairing, and uh, I ca- I can't really complain about it. Nor can I really complain about Weidman. Weidman's been doing exactly what he's been brought in to do. Yeah, he's looked pretty good to me. Um. With Butler, I how would you say it's one of those things that because the season is going to be so condensed and so many games back to back, having an extra guy that is a competent top six defenseman is a good thing. Even though Butler can be kind of inconsistent at times. And I'm really glad that Brody has stepped up, especially with Weidman. Because it seems to, they seem to have a good balance with each other. Mm-hmm. Are you saying then that you don't think Anton Babchuk is a top six defenseman? No. <laughs> um, that's re- that's reasonable. It's, he's more of a slap shot, basically. It, 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 like how Tampa Bay used to utilize uh, Mark Andre Bergeron. Like, they'd just throw him out on the power play, and that's it. And you'd get, like, one minute of regular ice time otherwise. Like, if you used Babchuk in that sense, then that might be okay. But, you know, it seems like a waste of a roster spot. I, I was uh, I was about to say, if Marc-Andre Bergeron had a chronic overeating disorder, he'd be Anton Babchuk. Well, I mean, not that Anton Babchuk is fat. Maybe, I don't know. What am I looking for here? I don't know. You're looking up his weight on. or something? No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not looking up anything. I, I've uh, I've learned my lesson after the audio snafus of the last episode. Uh, one thing I did really want to talk about was uh, in Vancouver we had three instances of blatant I'll, I'll go so far as to call it abuse of Mika Kiprasov. Uh, we had the I think it was Yannick Hansen two handed slash across the pants, which resulted in nothing i don't think um we had i think there was a shove then we had kevin bieksa uh running into him on a on some sort of i can't remember what the exact situation is i know bieksa ran him and then zach cassian ran him and i was thinking to myself if that happened if if someone ran jonathan quick or tuka rask do you think the they would get a polite shove, or do you think someone would beat the crap out of them? Well, the problem is, is that especially with the defensemen all being more passive, offensive type defensemen, that we don't have a guy like Robin Regeer who'll just deck the guy. So it's a little bit difficult, uh, unfortunately, and you know. I don't like seeing Kipper being run, but I don't really know that you can do much after, with, even with the forwards, because there's not really too many fighters on the team. 
Yeah, I agree. This is one of the first years I think I can remember in a long time that this team hasn't had somebody, not necessarily a goon, but just that tough guy. I mean, Jackman's probably the closest we've got to having a tough guy dressed on the roster. You know what, though? I I just think you have to try. And, you know, if you get your ass kicked, you get your ass kicked. But at least you stood up and said, you're not going to... You're not just going to do this and walk away scot-free. You're going to have to drop the gloves. You're going to have to answer the call. And you know what? When people talk about um, the instigator uh, negating some of uh, these types of fights, this is the sort of instigator, this is the sort of penalty that you take. Like, if you can kill off any number of chicken s uh, hooking and slashing and that stupid new moving the winning a face off with your glove rule penalties you can kill off a, a a penalty where you stand up for your goalie and say he's off limits and if not you're going to have to you're going to risk getting punched in the face yeah i think you're right and you know there's been a lot of talk about the refs this year and what they are and aren't going to call and increasing the frequency of some calls so i think the players might still be trying to figure out what they can get away with that that's that's fair on the other on the flip side but still i mean that's the sort of thing i don't know if you can do this but every if i were a coach in this situation everyone who's on the ice and if if sorry if the goalie gets run and you're on the ice and nobody does anything everyone gets fined and maybe it goes to a charity or whatever but you have to send a message. You know, just get that the that owners to complain about which charity and trying to decide on that too. It'll be included in the next CBA agreement. Well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So, guys, why don't we look ahead now to the next week? Unless anyone has anything else they want to get to, but we've got uh, on Thursday we've got the Avalanche coming to town. Saturday we got the Blackhawks and then the Red Wings next Tuesday. Any thoughts on that stretch? Well, it'll definitely be a bigger test to see whether the Flames continue to play like they did against Edmonton or if they revert back to prior games, especially with the Blackhawks being undefeated at this point. I would uh, I would say 2-1 and one out of that stretch would be fairly miraculous. I don't see the team beating Chicago at all. Um, but meanwhile, Detroit looks awful like and i know losing the best defenseman of the last 20 years does that to you but oh my goodness like that team needs to figure some stuff out or this is finally the year when everyone who picked them to miss the playoffs for the last eight years gets to finally dance around in victory which you know proves the rule that even a blind squirrel finds a nut which, you know, I'd like to know if that's actually true, because I think blind squirrels just get eaten by hawks. Why don't you tell everybody how they can let you know on Twitter if they know if that's true Absolutely. or not? Absolutely. If, if anybody knows if blind squirrels don't just get eaten by raptors, please tweet me at Luke1701, L-U-C-1701. And how dare you, Calgary, not a single one of you followed me last week. And I know that's probably because we did, you didn't get to the end of the episode, because we're not worth 90 minutes of your time but hopefully this week a little bit more please thank you i'm looking forward to thursday's game against the avalanche they had a big loss to the oilers and i think it might shake their confidence um i think the blackhawks we can get out of that one if this team plays like they did in edmonton with a w or at least uh one point Detroit, it's going to be tough. And then, I mean, that starts really where the Flames' road stretches are happening. That Detroit, we got a three-game road stretch there, and then these guys start having prolonged road series, which is what I'm worried about. Oh, well, every team's going to be going through this, so hopefully they can face the adversity and get some points on the board. Last episode, we said that if the team hadn't really picked it up and shown who they were by the 14th of February, Valentine's Day, we thought that they weren't going to make the playoffs. Do you guys still think that's a realistic deadline? Yeah. Uh, Even if they're making progress towards being, like, 10th, because they're currently 15th right now, if they're making progress towards the playoff spot, then sure, but they do really have to get a lot of points in the next little bit. 
Yeah, that gives us seven games before the 14th. So I think that's a reasonable number. I think having seven games to pick it up and show what we're made of is good. Yeah, I think they need to get about 10 points out of that. Yeah, I'd agree. I would just say that uh, in such a shortened schedule, um, with so many teams getting off to pretty hot starts, especially in conference like the Sharks and the Blackhawks, um, they need to step up right now. Um, th- th- there's no time to waste. Preseason's over, boys. Yeah, I really think as soon as February hits with the uh, Blackhawks game on the second, that's when this team has to know what they're doing, and they've got to be in season mode. Well, hopefully, the uh, the win over the Oilers was a confidence booster, but it's difficult to get too overconfident over a win. Yeah. Against One the thing I am hoping for on Thursday is Berchi being in the lineup. He actually suffered a knee injury in practice today, so they're waiting on tests tomorrow. So hopefully it's just nothing minor than a minor tweak and he can carry on. Get well soon, Sven. Tweet me if you want to know where to, if you if you can let me know where to send flowers. I don't think he wants flowers from you, because that's kind of creepy. No, it's not. A candy gram is creepy if it sings. Why don't you get him a barbershop quartet? Oh, I think he'd like it. <laughs> no. I'd like it. If someone wants to send me a barbershop quartet, tweet me at Luke1701. M- Matt, should we get him a barbershop quartet? No. <laughs> he hasn't earned it yet. <laughs> All right, there you go, Lucas. you got to work harder to earn your barbershop quartet. Yes, I do. All right, guys. Well, if anyone, anything else you guys want to talk about this week before we wrap up the episode? I'm good. I have nothing else to say. All right, I think it's going to be a fun week for the Flames fans. I think we're all coming off the high of that Oilers win and looking forward to having the Avalanche come to town. Uh, So we'll reconvene in about a week, and hopefully we'll still have positive spirits then. Going around the table, I'm Dan with my co-host Matt Lucas, and thanks for listening to Episode 2 of the Fireside Chat. We'll see you again next week. Suck it, Tom. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. Theme music, Take the Lead, by Kevin McLeod.